all started as a typical mission. We had an 0800 takeoff, and I was flying as flight lead, leading the four ship. We were on several targets that day. First of all, we interdicted some roads that has blasted craters in them so as to halt the flow of supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Then we went after a suspected truck park. You see, they hide the trucks under the trees during the day, so you can't see them from the air. But our FAC, forward air controller, he figured he knew where they were, so he marked the area with a smoke rocket. We were working over that target when the guns came up. Dateline, Southeast Asia. Authorities reported the loss of one aircraft from ground fire. The pilot was rescued by helicopter. In that one line, there's a story. This is a story about that story. About that special breed of men who go into combat that others may live. in 10 seconds. Their day begins early. Five, four, three, two, one, act. Lieutenant Moore, I'll give the weather. Well, gentlemen, good morning. The weather this morning in Area A is 4,000 scattered. Top There's a lot they have to know about their job. In area B, Strike missions, broken, weather, 7, intelligence. In the area. They wear King Arthur's carry crewmen known as PJs. They fly super jollies, or buffs. They're watched over by Sandys and Spads, nursed by a ship called King. They'll follow a voice into the valleys of hell to pick him up alive. They call them the Jolly Green Giants. An aircraft may cost several million dollars but it's still the expendable part of the man-machine team. The longer a pilot is down in the jungle, the less chance there is of getting him out alive. When the call comes in, recovery operations must start now, within seconds. Minutes would be too long. Sergeant Patrick, what is the uh, weight and balance on you? Mission gross weight would be 38,200. We have 100% available. Every man must know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and he must want to do it. 95 at 150. Who's number one PJ, sir? We haven't plugged yet, sir. You got a point in? Yeah. Ed, you got it. Sorry about that. Number one PJ. That's dedication. You have to be dedicated to consider the winner of a coin toss the low man, the first one down the cable into enemy-infested jungle. There's a man for every job. No more, no less. Not many, but every man has his place. The pilot, who gets them in and out of the hot spots, keeps the ship in hover while they make the pickup. The co-pilot, who maintains constant radio contact to get the word when to move in and out, where to hold and when. The flight engineer, who operates the hoist to let the penetrator down, brings up the survivors, mans a gun, commands the aircraft during the pickup. The PJs, pararescue men, both manning guns, both ready to risk their lives on the ground to pick up a disabled pilot, both trained in surgery to make emergency repairs until they can get the survivor back to a hospital. bird and the low bird to a forward base. They have to be in reach of trouble when trouble comes. 
But the Jolly Greens aren't alone in this mission. There's a team behind them, above them, around them. There's King, air control for all search and rescue, or SAR as they call it. They fly in the area where the strike missions are scheduled. They're a combination watchdog and mother hen. They look and listen for a pilot in trouble. They bring in help when it's needed. They locate the trouble spot, guide and coordinate the recovery team. That's what it's all about, getting a downed pilot out of the jungle before the enemy gets to him. At another base, the Sandys, the slow movers, wait for the call that will bring them into action to fly protective cover for the Jolly Greens to clear the pickup area of enemy ground fire. Behind this airborne team are the ground control centers, Jack and Queen, strategically located so one of them will always be in contact with the action. Back at the command post, the prime rescue control and reporting center. Here, all the details of every SAR effort are received and recorded as they occur. Command decisions are made, orders sent out to put all available men and equipment to the best possible use. When a man goes down, everything comes to a stop until they get him out. We got shot at on every mission. They say it's the ones you don't see that get you, and it did me. There was a lot of firing, but it really didn't bother me. You get so wrapped up in what you're doing, plus you believe so much in what you're doing. Sure, you're busy. You're busy too, but still, you see that red stuff coming up at you, and it gets your attention real quick. You know what it can do to you, but it just doesn't bother you. It just makes you want to hit your target that much more. Waiting is the hardest part of all. Sometimes the waiting lasts for days, but no one minds. It means our pilots are getting through, coming back. Then there's always that one time, the reason for their being here. I never actually saw where they were firing from. I could never pinpoint their position. But I went in and made one drop where I figured they were, and then my number four man went in. As I pulled off, I was in a position to observe his roll in, so I rolled in behind him to cover him down the chute. He made his drop, and then I hosed off a few rounds of 20 millimeter to keep the enemy heads down as he pulled off. Then as I was pulling off, I didn't see or feel anything. And I was on the radio telling the guys to rejoin so we could go back to our post-strike tanker and get some gas so we could go home. When all of a sudden, the nose of the airplane just started weaving around real funny-like, and I thought, this can't be happening to me. But it was. That's when things begin to happen. Okay, Jim, get it out of burner now. Get it out of burn. I'm out of burn. Sue, there's a tiger. Do you have him in sight? Roger, I've got him in sight. Okay, babe, you got it. Roger. Call sign. Position. Is the disabled aircraft still in the air? Basic information to get the mission started. Hi, Roger, 7-1. Could you give us vectors for channel 7 to start off with? Okay, uh, we got vectors for uh, 7-1 for channel 7. Roger. Hold down, Jim. Holding down, leaders, holding down. The position is plotted. Oh, let's make sure we want to lay down. King leaves to go where the action is. Roger, we're rolling out 218 this time. This is even 218 is a good heading blank, 97 miles. 97 miles, heading to 218. I still had the nose above the horizon, so I locked in the slab and lit the afterburner and she started climbing. I leveled off around 10,000 and everything seemed reasonably stable, so I nosed her around towards the border in friendly territory. Everything was fine for a while, but then I noticed she was slowing down, rapidly approaching a stall speed. I had to get more speed out of her, so I reached down and punched off all the external stores, the empty wing tanks and things like that. And I don't know what happened, but when that stuff left, the nose just flopped right on over, and she started down. After she stabilized out, I reached down and shook the stick one more time in a last-ditch effort, but nothing happened, so I figured I must have been hit in the hydraulic system and lost all my fluid. Anyway, while she was going down, the guys above me were screaming, get out, get out, so I guess it must have looked pretty bad. I know it sure felt bad inside that cockpit, but I couldn't have gotten out then if I wanted to. When she did nose over, I took a lot of negative G and found myself floating up against the 
canopy. So even if I could have initiated the ejection sequence, all I would have done is compressed my spine and killed myself right then. So I had to stick with her. But once she did stabilize out, I tried to slow her down by getting everything out that I could, dropping the gear, putting out the speed brakes, anything. And once I did that, I reached down and hit the handles and squeezed the triggers, and after that, the sequence was standard, standard. I heard the big rush of wind as the canopy separated, and then I felt a kick in the bottom, and up I went. Okay, the guy, how close to the UTN, how close to the gear, He's at least 20 miles from the border. Uh, okay. Five. When I went out, I felt some flailing, and when I saw that open chute, I was really happy. The first thing I thought about was the landing, a parachute landing fall. So I reached down and attempted to deploy my seat kit containing my life raft and all that stuff, but I just didn't have the strength in my right arm to pull the handle. So I figured the next best thing would be to get in position for the fall with the hands on the risers and my legs together and my knees slightly bent. I thought I'd got into this position, but when I checked, I looked up and my right arm was on the riser, but I couldn't find my left. So I reached over and, well, I guess my left arm was wrapped somewhere behind my back because I hit myself right in the armpit. I had perspired a lot in the target area because we never use cockpit pressurization. So when I felt the moisture, all I could think was, you dummy, you left your arm in the cockpit. Then I looked down at my feet, and they were just dangling. So I thought the only thing left is to put my good right arm in front of my face in preparation for a tree landing. And that's the last I remember until I was on the ground. When a pilot is down, everything comes to a stop until they get him out. Anything that flies that's in the area is on call by King. and flak spots are plotted. Safe routes and holding areas are marked, relayed to the Sandys and Jolly Greens. All right, Sue, could you give me the elevation of the area and the temperature down the valley, please, sir? I don't have the temperature, but the elevation is going to be around 2,500 feet, or something like that. All right, I can understand 2,500. Thank you very much. Houston, Sandy 1 and 2, request vectors. Sandy 1 and 2, the default mode, 3, 1, when I came to on the ground, the first thing I heard was my wingman flying overhead. I listened for other noises for a while and then got out my survival radio and started talking to my number two man. Actually, all my wingmen stayed with me practically the, the whole time I was on the ground. They did have to make a run back to a tanker for gas, but they even staggered that so that I wasn't alone very long. My number two man even came down and made some low passes and shot some film in case they couldn't get me out that day. Then he told me he was scared. He told me I'd landed in a valley between two ridges and that about a mile and a half away there was a village. That means a road, and that's where Charlie is. Now, Roger, uh, let's let Sandys come in and take a look, please. Right. The Sandys come in for a quick look at the pickup area. The Jolly Greens hold back and orbit in a safe area. The Sandys drag the area to draw Charlie's fire, spot his guns, hose down anything that looks hostile. Charlie has a habit of hiding when he knows a pilot is down. He holds back until the chopper is in hover, the cable down. Then he opens up. Okay, have me on the side, choppers. I just have insight. Okay, the parachute is directly off my left wing. The searching, circling very tightly around it. This is what it's all about. This is what they've trained for. Months, years, made dry runs, gone through proficiency evaluations, honed the edges sharp so they could cut the mustard when the chips were down. I was unconscious on and off. I thought my left arm was missing and my legs just wouldn't do what I wanted them to. Then... When I hit, I landed on this bamboo and was sort of impaled on the young shoots. 
But it wasn't too bad because my head was elevated a little bit and so were my feet. So I think this helped me keep conscious. So I just laid right there. As I laid there, I just listened for voices, truck engines, things like this. Then I got out my radio and started talking to my number two man. Then another aircraft came in the area and an A1E driver started talking to me on the radio, asking me personal authenticator questions. You see, when a pilot's captured, Charlie will sometimes use his radio to draw in the rescue forces and shoot them down. So they have these questions that only you can know the answer to. Well, I gave him all the answers, plus some of the questions, my name, rank, serial number, anything I could think of. And he came back sort of chuckling and said, don't sweat it, babes, we're going to get you out. And that really gave me a good boost, just to hear that, to know that you're not alone out there. Chris one, this is Firefly. We have you located. We have you located. The helicopter is on the way in. Charlie, say one, Connor. Good. Press that one. Right, you uh, hovering over the survivor now? A negative, we're coming in left down. We're coming in now. Okay. Let me know when the PJ's away. Kingfish 1, Kingfish 1, this is Firefly 42. We have your parachute in sight. We have you in sight. The helicopter is close by. Uh, Kingfish 1, uh, what's your position for your shoot? Uh, Kingfish is in his shoot. Uh, he says he's got both legs broken, so he hasn't moved around any. Roger. We got you. We're coming in over you. but I really don't remember much pain on the ground or anywhere. The only bad thing was that when I went out, my visor shattered and I cut up my face. Then when I hit, I landed either on or near an anthill and those little rascals got in every cut plus in my nose and my mouth and my eyes and just everywhere. But that's the only real discomfort I had. Well, except when the chopper came because I was still in my chute and I was still impaled on that bamboo. And the downwash of the chopper caught my chute and started to drag me. I'm sort of embarrassed to talk about it now, but I really let out a yell. I just couldn't help myself. They told me later that that was why it took them 15 minutes from the time they got there till the time they got me out. They had to back off and lower one PJ, and then he had to hack his way into me and get me ready for a pickup. Then they had to come back in and lower another PJ with a litter. Then the two of them had to pick me up off the bamboo and put me in the litter, and then they had to make the pickup. But I must have passed out because I don't remember that at all. The one thing I do remember, though, is that big smiling face coming at me with that M16 rifle. I just knew it had to be one of ours. From there on, I just dropped my radio and said, get me out of here. Are you ready, PJ? Okay, can you come over and get us now? Can you come and get us now? I'll try to put a smoke in. Pop this smoke, pop this smoke, PJ. Survivor now. Roger.
aboard the chopper, I do remember quite a bit about what they were doing and saying to me and all. They did tell me that it would be a one-hour flight from where they picked me up to where we'd be putting down, but I don't remember it being that long. At least it didn't seem that long to me. Again, I don't remember feeling very much pain, but it must have been there. The only thing I can think of is that the nerves were damaged or I was in shock. But I do remember looking around and seeing them all smiling and masking for cold water when they tried to give me warm, stale water out of a canteen. But beyond that, not really too much other stuff. My deepest regret is that I didn't personally thank those fellows right there on board the chopper. I don't know, I was just so happy. I'm sure they could see it on my face. It's just so great to know that you're not alone when you're up there flying. To know that if a pilot does go down, everything literally comes to a halt until they get him out. Then, too, I know that getting him out must be a deep satisfaction to them. I'm out of the Air Force now, back in school. I'm fine, too. Except, well, I can't quite straighten out my left arm all the way. It was broken in seven places, and I dislocated both my knees, causing me to have to wear braces on them for a short while. But recently, I did get rid of the left brace, and so even though I will have to wear the right brace for the rest of my life, I think it's a pretty small price to pay, considering where I could be now. I attribute my good condition to the great care they took of me. Twelve hours after I was picked up, I had been thoroughly checked over at one hospital and was on my way to another in the Philippines. The very next morning, I was in surgery. Then, when I'd recovered sufficiently from that, they sent me to a special orthopedic hospital at Wright-Patterson for all kinds of physical therapy. They gave me a 90% disability, but you would know it to look at me now. I'm out on temporary retirement until my condition clears up as best it can. I go back in for reevaluation every 18 months. I had a little pipe dream about staying in the Air Force or even going with an airline, but that's out now. I had a lot of time to really think about what I wanted to do for a living, and I decided my best bet was to take advantage of the vet's benefits under the GI Bill and go back to school and get my master's in business administration. They don't get them all. Nobody can bat a thousand, but they've racked up a pretty good score. Some thousand air crew members are alive today because of rescue and recovery in Southeast Asia. It's a simple philosophy. When a man is downed, he isn't just a statistic. He's a fellow American with a family at home, with hopes and dreams and a potential that can't be measured. He's a man in trouble. He needs help fast. One air rescue pilot summed it up for all air rescue men when he said, there's nothing in the world like the feeling you get when you've saved someone's life, when you've had a part in bringing that help that others may live.